right, so welcome. Uh, I am Neil Roche. And I'm off here at Harvey Mudd. I have taught both here at Harvey Mudd the last couple of years. And a few years ago, I taught at UCSD. And then most recent, and then, and then most of my work has been in industry. So I was a staff software engineer at Google for seven years um, there, about five years ago. And so I am back teaching because I like teaching. So here I am. A couple of things. Let's just go through sort of the first 15 minutes and kind of minutia of the class itself. Okay, one thing that I use are um, these cards for calling on people. So I shuffle these at the beginning of class and then I usually call on people. Um, yes, it kind of puts you on the spot, um, but you can say pass. Just don't say pass every time. All right. And this will also try and help me learn your names. Um, I'm terrible with names. I hope I have everyone's name who like I taught last semester. Um, and uh, I hope the ones from the year before, but not necessarily. So don't be offended if you're okay with your name. Right. And I may often ask you to spell it because that helps me remember uh, your name. So Alfredo, Varun, don't help me. Help me. Nick. Nick, that's right. Yeah, that's, it's hard because I have a son named Nick. Uh, so, for Nick. So, we'll go through other people as well throughout the day, but I will be, as I say, be calling on people. The, let's just look through the syllabus a bit. So, we will talk about what reinforcement learning is in just a moment. Now, again, just sort of the minutia of the class itself. The course website is here, so tilde road slash rl, uh, and that includes basically this syllabus and the schedule is roughly what it is. We'll look at both of those. We do use Piazza, so if you have any questions, my preference would be rather than sending them to me via email, post them on Piazza. And my preference would be, unless it's something personal that just could not possibly, anyone else could have the same question, make a public question. Two reasons for that. One, then I don't have to answer it multiple times because someone else may ask the question. Two, uh, someone else may not ask me, but may still want the answer. And three, someone else may have the, the answer as well. And so I might not be able to respond as quickly as someone else. <coughs> that being said, if you need to email me, feel free to email me. There are course videos, so I try and um, so this doesn't always work because of technical difficulties, so don't count on this. But I do a lot of work on the board, some on the screen, everything gets recorded and gets put into a video on YouTube. So people can say how well that worked or not worked last, uh, last semester. It works pretty well. And I'm happy to say I am, as we speak, interviewing virtual assistants to actually do the editing for me rather than having me do it. I have one in Russia, one in Bangladesh, and one in the US. Guess they're all trying it out. We'll see who does best. Guess who's charging the least? U.S., Bangladesh, Russia. U.S. Because I think his eyes will get. <laughs> so he said he was busy this week. He had what it was studying for exams and practice. So hi. There's nothing in chair. Let's see what's on. So. There are 24 people enrolled, so can you raise your hand if you're not enrolled? So you can stand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to Oh, it's okay. I can be sure. Yeah, I'll sit on the floor. Tell you what, I am also happy with you doing. If you want to bring another chair in, you can do that. Are you trying to... Um, Maybe, earn? yeah. Okay, so today you could be in here. Okay. From now on, it's yeah. just whatever 24 we have. And the fact that all 24 Sorry. people are here, Unless, is anyone here planning on dropping? They showed up to the first day class, but plan on dropping. Okay. Unlikely that we're going to be able to uh, get you in class, and I'm sorry, my chair. Oh, okay. You sure? Uh, the grading. So grading is based on four components. There are weekly homeworks, which the lowest one is dropped, um, so that will take care of you 
missing a class for some reason, for example, or having interviews or whatever else that you might have. If you've got some real problem, you know, where you can get the dean to send me some information, then we can talk about that. But in general, that would be true for the homework, for the quizzes and for the programming assignments. The homework is, and this is a little unusual, so graded based on making a reasonable try. So not on correctness. Um, so <coughs> the quizzes, however, are based on correctness. And there are basically weekly quizzes as well that are very similar to the homeworks. So they're based on the homework and also the reading assignments. Does that make sense? Any questions? It's all up on the schedule. It's still plenty of There are programming assignments. I believe there are eight of them. Um, they're all uh, on the schedule as well. The lowest of that will be dropped as well. As you can see, that's weighted fairly heavily, 30%. And then there are three exams, two midterms, which are, um, what do we call them? Uh, cover the material in the first uh, part of the uh, semester and sort of the next two thirds. And then the exam is a cumulative exam. The course isn't graded on a curve. These are basically the percentages I'm looking at for grades. Pluses and minuses get thrown in, thrown in as appropriate. I reserve the right to decrease these percentages here. That is, give A's, let's say, something less than 90%, um, but I will not increase them. And all of the grades uh, are on Sakai. All of the homeworks are, and all the homeworks are um, grade scope. Okay, so you'll have to either, you'll have to create a PDF of your homework by hook or by crook, you know. If you, have, if you have to take a picture of it with your phone, that is my least favorite because it is hard to read. And do whatever you do, look at it first on your computer or on your phone and see if it's readable. Because if it's not readable to you there, I can't read it very well on my screen. And I hate squinting. So. The textbook is this textbook and we'll be following it fairly closely. So Sutton and Barto are sort of the reinforcement learning guys. They have been doing this since the late 70s. There was a First, version, first edition of the book, I believe in the 80s. And reinforcement learning just was not a really big thing until, well, why, are you, why are you all guys here? What do you know about reinforcement learning? AI uses it. Okay, AI uses it. We will start with that after we finish this. Homeworks. Uh, they're due the beginning of lecture on Mondays. And class starts at 1.15, they're due at 1, not at 1.15. Okay, so that you have 15 minutes then to get here or whatever else. And sometimes I actually get some of them graded before, before class. Uh, quizzes are in class, I think always on Mondays, we'll see on the schedule in just a moment. And they may be at the beginning of class or maybe at the end of class, it'll depend on the day. Program assignments. Um, those, I have not, not yet decided whether every one of them will be individual or whether we might do some of those group. I am happy to hear your input on that and what you would like. They um, are usually a, well, they are all, I believe, going to be done on Collab, Google's Collab, so basically a Jupyter Notebook, Notebook in the cloud. So that's a, a handy way not to have to try and set up uh, systems. And normally what will happen is I'll give you a starter notebook and then you will work from there. The, there's no late on quizzes, there's no late on homework. However, for programming assignments, there is 72 hours of lateness available. So you can use those throughout the semester. Okay, and there's a little bit of information about kind of what to do with regards to that. Uh, collaboration, unless there's any specific program assignment that is a joint program assignment, everything you should do. Office hours, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, so I'm not on campus, Thursday, 10 Fridays. Uh, there's an hour, sorry, half an hour on Mondays and an hour on Wednesdays uh, after the course, down in the cafe. And beyond that, it'll be at my office in Oldham. So Monday, roughly before class, Wednesday before class, and Tuesday all morning. 
if you want to try and we can set up some alternate office hours by arrangement, but email me to see. It's very unlikely it'll be Thursday or Friday, because I'm not here and I don't want to come in just for that. Uh, and if I'm in the cafe and you have something you need to talk about privately, just let me know and we will excuse ourselves. Okay, and then the schedule. So, by the way, I'm just proud of myself trying to get this virtual assistant to create the uh, videos for me uh, in terms of this setting up automation. That's kind of something I haven't thought about over the Christmas. And so, I'm also very happy with stuff on the automation for the schedule. So, I actually have a raw Excel spreadsheet that has like what the readings are and so on. And it goes through and every 15 minutes creates this file for me. And like looks to see, is there a video posted on YouTube? And if so, creates a link for it. So. As programmers, we should try to make our life easier. Sometimes we don't. Uh, and I have a bad habit of not. But anyways. So as we can see, there's reading in the textbook. Basically, it's the first chapter. Normally, the reading should be done before class. So really, the reading should be done before class, and then again after class. Okay. So for instance, the couple of sections in chapter two you should read before class. Do you understand all, all of it? No. But you have had exposure to it, and you've seen some of the terminology and so on. That is my expectation. Then we'll go over to class, and then afterwards, you need to go back over it. Anything I talk about in class, and anything they sign reading, you are responsible for. Will the quizzes be more focused on the readings or what we've been talking about in class? Or like, 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 like for the quizzes, like, is it like expected that we, it's from the reading previous for it? Like, it'll be everything up. Okay, so it will not be for the reading for that day. Oh. Okay, so it's things that have occurred in the past. And the homework. I can't guarantee it, but often, if you've done the homework, you will know, you know, you will do all the quiz. Gotcha. Uh, I think that's about it. We can see the reds basically are when stuff is due. The green are the exciting times when there's no class uh, and vacation. And that is about it. Any questions so far? Okay. So what is reinforcement learning? I guess it doesn't look sleep. Stuff, but can't you also 
games. Games is an excellent example. So give me an example of a game. So, Mark. Uh, well, hold on just a second. I cannot. Mark. All right. Uh, go. Not that I'm confusing you, I'm just trying to. Okay, so Go is a good example. Uh, go is one kind of an example. So games are commonly used. With our go is one. Um, so you as the agent, or let's say the game player, or rather the computer as the agent is the game player, interacting with the environment. Let's figure out what that is. Rewards. What might our reward be in playing Go? Um, just like you're closer to winning than your opponent. So you could do closer to you closer to winning, and that's a common a common thing to want to avoid in reinforcement learning. Don't reinforce things like what you want to reinforce. Reinforce what you actually want. What do you want from a go player? To win. To win. That's what we reinforce. Winning. We don't reinforce how good a control they have, or anything else, or how good the tip, you know, it looks for them. We reinforce winning, okay? So part of doing reinforcement learning and setting up the system is designing rewards. Okay. But there are easy ones, and it goes example of doing. Uh, Ali, do you have other games? Like chess. Chess, those are all go-ish, yeah. right? How about computer games? Uh, I don't know what the game is. <laughs> Help her out. Starcraft recently. Starcraft. Those are, it's a complicated game. Give me a simple game. <laughs> also, you have three forces playing now. Pac-Man. Pac-Man, sure. Okay. Or, where do you play Pong? Okay, you have actually played Pong. Okay, yeah. So Pong would be an example too. So simple ones. Space Invaders and stuff like that. All of those successfully have used reinforcement learning to solve them. And it's very simple with something like, let's say, Pac-Man, right? In Pac-Man, imagine you are the agent. And you are interacting with an environment. How are you interacting? Um, Pascal, you play Pac-Man, what are the interactions you can do? Um, yeah. play. If you're playing a video game, like an arcade game. I don't know. Okay, help mouse. Who's sitting? Uh, Nelson. Nelson. Uh, you can go in four directions. Okay, left, right, up and down. That's it, right? Actually, that's all you can do. <laughs> oh, well, you can do nothing. Uh, can you do nothing? It's an it keeps going the same way, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think, actually. So, left, right, up and down. There's no buttons to press. That's it. So your interaction with the environment is up, down, left, and right. Your environment is like what you see on the screen. Like that's your environment. Uh, maybe, possibly, what you hear. Uh, and then what are your rewards? Uh, Will? Um, rewards, um, uh, I guess for, for Pac-Man. For Pac-Man, uh, well, one, you don't want to die, and then you want to get like this, the dots and these things. On the What's screen. the reward? Um, or Let's say you and I are playing, and we say, I'll bet you 10 bucks I do, I do better than you. How do we know? Who won? Oh, how do you win in Pac-Man? <laughs> <laughs> score. Score. Oh, score. Yeah. Right. So there's this the high score, right? You, if you're high score, you get to put your name on that. So that would be an example of the reward. And an important part, but so, so the goal is to maximize. I'm going to just say here right now, maximize reward. I think there's something missing there. So if I maximize the reward, let me give you an example. I'm in Pac-Man. I'm trying to get the bad guy, right? And well, what is it, the ghost or something? I don't know. There's some special treasure, let's just say, in a generic game. So there's a special treasure I want to get. And if I get the special treasure, I get 100 points. But there's a bad guy right next to the treasure. And as soon as I get the treasure, the bad guy's gonna eat me, and like the game will be over. Do I want to get the treasure? No. But I get 100 bucks, maximize reward. 100. 100 is good, right? 
If I don't go there, I get zero. What do I need in this? Kaki? Uh, uh, Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Okay. The correct word? The what? The correct word. Well, correct, yes. So what, when we talk about correct, why are you here in class and studying and working hard rather than, I don't know, staying home and watching friends or partying or whatever you're doing? Wouldn't it be more rewarding to watch your favorite show? I don't actually know friends. But can you think of something that would be more fun to be doing than being here right now? <laughs> <laughs> Because? To apply in the future. In the future. And that's the key. You're looking at long term. Term the world. Okay? And to be clear, really, it's probably expected reward is what we're going to look at. Because there is uncertainty. So that's what reinforcement learning is like. And pictorially, we have an agent operating in an environment, taking actions, and receiving um, rewards. rewards, and also we have a new state, basically that happens. So the screen changes, noise gets made, um, I uh, have a new configuration of the Go board, um, all sorts of possible changed state. Okay, this is what the agent observes. So the agent observes the state, has a decision to make as to what action to take. So what we are trying to design is basically a protocol, some idea of what to do, given a particular state, what action are we going to take? So we have state to action mapping. If you're playing, let's not say poker, let's say you're playing uh, Rock to the table. Okay? And there's not really much state there, really, don't think. So let's say you and I will play. And we're going to play 10 times. Okay. Could I always say I'm going to take the same action? Would that be good for me? Say I'm always going to do rock. Because I could be exploited, right? So there needs to be some probability here, some eligibility for probability. So we actually need some probability distribution over actions in the general case. So we need the possibility of non-deterministic policy. Right, so pi is our policy. This is what we're trying to learn. The goal is learn a policy. Okay. That tells us what to do. That will then maximize, as best as we can, our long-term expected reward. So some of the terminology, we have policies, we have states. So a state, uh, can be simple, like the state of a board, or so on. States might only, we're going to talk, so this is a big overview of this, right? We're talking much more detail here, but let's actually just stick with the idea of the state and not get too far into that, right? Uh, and then we also often will want to know a value function. This is how we are going to often figure out a good policy, is decide what is the value of this state. That is, if I am in this state, what do I expect my long-term total reward from being in this state to be? As an example, 
if you're doing tic-tac-toe, and we're going to go through a much longer example here in a moment, but let's say you're tic-tac-toe and your X. Whoops, and let's say that winning is one reward, and losing is zero reward, and a draw is a half. If this is your state, what do you expect the value of this to be? Um, Sean, right? That I already did you kind of just the best. Uh, okay. Maybe you're somewhere. Where are you? No, you're right there. Okay. <laughs> for who? For which player? For X. Um, one. Yeah, the, we would expect the value to be one. Now, this value function is the expected uh, long-term reward uh, from starting in a state. And really, it's dependent on a policy, right? If your policy here is not to put an X here, then you can't really expect that you're going to win, right? So if you have a policy, we can say, what's the value of that policy, or of the state for that policy? Does the concept make sense? Let me think of what else I need to do before we go on to the tech toe. Oh yeah, I just forgot where we were. Okay. One thing about the reward is that the reward we are always going to say is a state word. Right? That is a real. So we're not going to have some pair of values. You know, we, this way we can always compare what's a better reward, what's a, work, work, a oh, worse reward. Linearize. Now, is that reasonable? We'll talk more about that later. Actually, this is this is our intro, so we don't get too too stuck in the weeds. So let's go to tic-tac-toe. So now that I know there are people who haven't played Pong or Space Invaders or tic-tac-toe, or whatever that game we were playing, are the people who don't know tic-tac-toe? Knots and crosses. Knots and crosses? Uh, Do you know by that? Yeah, I know that. Okay, let's just, they're the same thing then. Okay. So, Let's look at tic-tac-toe as a reinforcement learning problem. And our agent is going to be the X player, who always goes first. So agent is the X player. What's our environment? Any thoughts? Uh, back to you. Or maybe not that to you, but I now know your name, so go ahead. Uh, it's just going to be the state of the board. That's the state of the board. So let's look at that for a second. Let's say we take an action. All right. Here we are. We've got an empty board. We say the state is, this is our state, our initial state. Right? S of zero. We take an action. Let's say we take an action placing the top left. What is our new state going to be? The board with the X in the top left. Have you ever played solitaire tic tac toe where you just put X's? No. No. It's not very challenging because you always win. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the model somehow an opponent. We're going to say that the opponent is going to be part of the environment. Okay. So when you put an X, right, and you leave the room and then you come back, what do we have on here besides an X? We have an L. Okay, so the environment is going to capture both the fact that we are placing our X and also the result of our opponent doing what our opponent does. We don't always set up reinforcement learning problems like this. Sometimes we might say we're going to have an agent playing against itself, 
right? So it's going to play X, and then it's going to play the O part, and then it's going to play the X part and the O part. And in that case, the state would just be what's the state of the board. But in our case, this, this environment is going to include our, our, our opposing player. So, for example, we have an empty board here. We go ahead, let's say, and take an action. I'm going to use a different color. We use red for the actions. So this is the state. Our action is an X on the top left. And then the result is going to be a new state. We know there's going to be X on the top left. And there's going to be an O somewhere. Let's say it's here. There's some uncertainty here, but we don't know what exactly will happen. For the moment, let's assume we have a player who is playing against us, the O player, uh, who's deterministic. So let's just make our life easier for the moment. Okay. So problem makes sense so far. Our goal is to estimate values. Having been very uh, trained tic-tac-toe players, what is the value of an empty board? That is, what is your expected result long-term? Assuming that win is a 1, lose is a 0, and draw is a 1 half. Uh, Nelson? Going half. Yeah, half. Right, if you have two good tic-tac-toe players, no one will ever win, right? But we don't know anything about our opponent. Our opponent may not be a real good tic-tac-toe player. We may decide this tic-tac-toe player is actually you know, my two-year-old nephew. And our expectation is like 0.98 if we're going to be winning. So could be. Does that make sense? So this is the environment. So we need, our goal is to try and figure out what our values of each of these states are. Because if we can figure out what our values are, we can figure out what to do. So if we know, for instance, that the va if we somehow find out, if we have an oracle tell us the value of this is zero. And if you instead took another action, like let's say you went in the middle, and that led them to a new state for the next in the middle and another, let's say, here. If the value of this, I don't know why that turned red. Um, if the value of this one were 0.9, and then the value of this one were 0, which would be a better choice to do? This one. And you would just kind of greedily say, I'm going to take the action that takes us to the higher value state. Is it in general that you learn, to learn the value before the policy? Often what happens is you have like a rep, you are learning the value and then using that to make your policy slightly better and then moving learning value and slightly better and so on. So it's this kind of dance back and forth that's happening. So, to begin with, we don't know anything, of course, about any of our states. And we could just say the value, we'll initialize it to one half, maybe. Okay? And so when we're initially playing a game and we need to choose a state, we'll just randomly choose, sorry, choose an action, we'll randomly choose one. And then we'll go here, its value is one half, the successive ones are one half, we randomly choose one, we keep going. Eventually, we're going to get to a leaf, right? What's a leaf node in this particular game? I'll try one. A finished board where like a result has been. Decided. Where are possible results? A win, a draw, or a lose. What's a draw? Uh, there is no three in a row of either. And. So, is this a draw? There's no three oh. in a row of either. And the board is full. Okay, and the board is full. So either someone has three in a row, or the board is full. Once we get down there into a leaf, we have a value, right? We know it's zero or one half or one. And we can then try and assign credit. 
That's sort of a big problem of reinforcement learning is the credit assignment problem. That is, I know I won, lost, or draw. How do I take that and somehow propagate that information back into what I did? And the simplest thing, and we'll see much more of this later, but the simplest thing to do would be to say, so let's look at a particular example, right? We have now a node, a state for which we have a value. And we're going to try and backtrack or move that value back. So I'm going to go from one state to a previous state. So I have But this is the more general case where we don't necessarily have the leaf. Think of the leaf kind of as a base case. So I have a state here. Oh, let's say and I took an action which is not an optimal action, but I took it nonetheless. And I went here, okay? Because if you're playing a three-year-old, you know, if, you, if you're learning a new tic-tac-toe player, you might in fact do that. And now that gave me a state uh, But luckily, this is also, we're playing a new player. So we're not very good, they're not very good either, right? They didn't stop us. And we find that the value of this state is, let's just say it's 0.8. Okay? That's what we've got so far. We haven't yet reached any convergence. Yes, this should probably converge to one eventually, but right now it's 0.8. What does that tell us about this state? If our current value of this state is 0.5, After taking this action and finding now this new value, this state is pointing. In. Okay, so we updated this value, this state. What should the value of the state be? Higher or lower? Higher, probably. Higher, probably. Kind of makes sense. So, in fact, if this one's point A, this should be at least point A. Right? If we've got an action we can take that leads us to some state that has a reward of 0.8, we can only do that or better. Right? As long as we're smart, we can do that or better. So this value should be at least 0.8. We are going to have an update rule, but we're going to talk about it in much more detail later, but just to kind of preview this. Our update rule is going to say that the value for, let's call this state S, and this state T we're going to say so this is V of S plus our difference between the two. Which if you look at it like this v of s equals v of s plus v of t minus v of s. This just simplifies the v of t, right? This would be this, the one that says, just go ahead and make it exactly equal with this one. But we are going to be doing gradual learning. So we're going to have a learning rate. So instead, we're going to have some sort of a gamma there between 0 and 1. So we're going to say, take some of our, let's call it error, and go a little bit of the way towards that. Does that make sense? Because this point eight might not be right. right. This might be our current best guess at it. But we're going to be updating that over the, in the future. And so we don't just want to be you know, making these huge changes all around. We want to make small changes. And in fact, if we take this learning rate and reduce it over time, we're guaranteed to converge to something. Let's talk now about greedy. Let's talk about our policy. Assume we have these 
estimates for our values of given states. When we're in a state, let's just be greedy. Let's say, let's take the action that takes us to the next state with the highest value. Okay? So let's say that is both things. Let's just update this for now. So in this particular case, this would equal 0.5 plus, assuming this is 0 0.1, 0 0.1 times 0.8 minus 0.5 equals 0.5 plus 0.103 equals 0.53. So we will nudge this in that direction. We're going to talk at so much length about these update rules later. So let's say this is 0.8. We've now updated this to be 0.53. And we have how many actions do we have available to us? Five, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five, let's say. Or maybe we could say there are nine. And if we try and go over here again, like we automatically lose because we broke the rules, right? But let's just say five for now. So one other possibility would be to take this action, all right? And that would take us to a state where, in fact, there wouldn't be any more of because the game would be over, as you planned out. Once you have three in a row, the game is over. However, we've never been down this path. We've never seen this state. So what was our estimate of the value of this state? Uh, Siobhan. For, the, uh, for this game, the state we've never been to. That is, what did we initialize our uh, values to for all the states? It's an end state, so I assume draw one half. Yeah, draw one half, just as we said at the beginning, let's just initialize every state to one half. Yeah. We could have chosen some other value too, but let's just initialize them all to one half. If that's the case, our value of this is equal to one half. Are we going to try and choose this one instead of this one? No, this one's 0.8, this one's 0.5. Clearly, this one's better. Because we're just learning, right? So, there's a problem in acting greedily. And the problem is, you might sort of be fixating on something too soon. Yes, I'm a little confused. If we were to initialize all states to one half, how we would have any learning at all? Like even if we follow down each leaf? And because we would follow down, we'd eventually get to a leaf, and we'd find we'd actually either win, lose, or draw. So why could we not determine that we had either won or lost or drawn in the, in the state that we marked as 0.5? Because we haven't been to this state yet. Right? There are, what, uh, uh, 3 to the ninth possible states. And we just blindly initialize them all to one half. And we, by the way, do not know the rules of the game, not necessarily. Okay? So we don't know that if we play this X here, we will win. All we know is we could play next here. We've never tried that. We've never been to whatever state this is. Uh, sorry, to this state. So, so we're going to initialize it to one half. I see. So, but, what, but if we follow this path down, right? If from here then we play an X here, we would win. We find a one. We propagate that back. This would go higher than 0.5. And now this worked for four. Right? It worked before. Let's keep going on this. And this would work, actually, if we have this uh, opponent who is deterministic, then if this worked once, this will always work. The problem is, in this particular case, uh, maybe they'll get better too, right? They might be what's called non-stationary. They, they might, the environment might be changing over time in the sense that the opponent is getting better. And if that's the case, this would be a bad choice, and this would be a better choice. So the, so the suggestion, yeah. How does the, the leaf on the left side, how does that get sent to one? What will happen is eventually the environment will say, right, we just get a bunch of zeros. We play, we put an X, we get a zero. 
we get a zero. But eventually, it's going to say, ding, 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 you won. You get a one. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, that's, that's how we will then have that statement. And the way this, this very simple update rule we're using right now actually relies on the fact that we only ever get rewards at the very end, at the, when the game is over. If we have a game like uh, uh, Pac-Man, we're getting points all the time as we're going. And this would not be an appropriate uh, uh, update rule because we're ignoring the immediate rewards that come along the way. And that's an important part. We will we'll get it. So how can we, Daniel, somehow um, use the information as to what we think currently is the best action to take, and yet still not rely solely on that. Um, you could like, um, I mean, what, I guess one thing you could do is um, weigh actions that you have a higher current expected value for, or whatever. Um, Choose them more likely, and choose other actions that are you have a lower value for less likely. Okay, that would be one possibility. This is point eight. This one's uh, point five, and therefore do some sort of weighting that says this is much more likely to be chosen. You know, within this let's say, or we could do something even simpler and just say we will we will ninety nine percent of the time take the greedy. One percent of the time we'll just randomly try something. And so that would allow us to ensure that eventually we will try all actions from all states. Because you never know, there might be good things there. Does that make sense? So, so we don't want to be greedy is a problem. Epsilon greedy is basically most of the time be greedy, but epsilon amount of the time, try something else. Normally, just all the possible actions. And that will ensure that we eventually try this path. And this path not only will give us a 1 now, but even if our opponent changes, we're always going to get a 1. And, and so this one, if our opponent changes, could start going down in value because we, they start going smart. But this one uh, will always be good. And so over time, assuming our opponent gets better, this will start getting better and better and better. It will certainly be at least as good as this, though. So my question is... Remind me your name. Mazda. I didn't know your name, right? No. My question Mazda, is... Mazda, M-A-Z-D-A? Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Um, is, it seems like there's two ways in which we lose time. And the first way would be to upfront mark some, uh, some section of our space of states as known uh, values, particularly the end boards before we get started. And the other one is to go about our, you know, whatever procedure we have for choosing new states. Um, and then that would also cost some time for eventually discovering end states. So how is there, is there like a uh, kind of robust way for us to be able to know which one takes more time? I, I didn't quite catch the first one. The first one is just initializing states. Yes, doing like a little bit more sophisticated initializing of states other than just everything the same. Yeah, we don't have any more. Actually, so let us let me see if I can address that indirectly by talking about what the elemental course is. Okay, and there's there's a little bit that will sort of take that. So there are a couple of different ways you can uh, separate the types of uh, the methods that we're going to be using for learning. So one way you can separate things is tabular versus non-tabular. By tabular, I just mean you have a table. So if you were playing tic-tac-toe, it's very easy to imagine you just create a big array of states in your Python program, and you assign values to them, and you work over time and update those values. Okay. However, 
there are problems for which that is not practical, where the number of states is combinatorially huge. Uh, chess, backgammon, go, anything like that, there's no way to store that table mapping every state to its value. So the tabular methods are the ones where we do go ahead and have exact values for every state. That's what we're going to be spending the majority of this class on. So let's look at this. We have banded problems. So banded problems are what we're going to start with on Monday. And those are simplifications of the reinforcement learning problem where we say we have no state. All we have are actions and rewards. And let's just forget about the fact that there's a state that could be changing. So this is no state. And then we are going to talk about MDPs, Markov decision processes. So this is basically a formulation of what the environment is. So our uh, model of basically what an environment is, okay, with uh, some expectations about that. Then we get to another fork in the road. So that fork in the road is model-based versus model-free. Model-based algorithms know their environment. So for instance, if you're playing a game, they know the rules of the game. They know if you take this action, what state you will end up in. Or if the, if the environment is non-deterministic, they know the probabilities of ending up in various states and also know the rewards that are going to come. So they have a good model of the environment. They know this, basically. Okay. Well, that gives a lot of power if you have that. And what will happen in the model base is we're basically going to be using dynamic programming as an approach to come up with an optimal policy. The model free, they're like, I don't know. I just walked up to this video game. I don't know how it works. I don't know what the rules are. I don't know how I get points. I need to just start playing with it and see what happens. That's the model for the case. And we're going to be looking at several different approaches there. One is Monte Carlo method. The Monte Carlo method basically is a um, probabilistic method that you use. Then we have so this is model free. We have another model free, which is temporal difference learning. This is really A key part, oh, key. A, a key result of the reinforcement learning field. It's really something new and nifty. The rest of the stuff was going to be like, yeah, that's kind of, that seems obvious. And then we've got along this. So MDP is on the bandit plus the state. After the temporal difference learning, we have in-step bootstrapping. So this is basically a, a spectrum between the Monte Carlo and the TD, where you can actually choose anywhere along the spectrum that you want. Combine those two. And then finally, kind of in this tabular method, we're going to look at planning. Planning is the concept of creating some sort of a model. You may not have the exact model, but some sort of a model so that you can think of it as play in your head. So rather than getting experience in real life with a real environment, you try and say, well, what if I did this? What would happen? How should I adjust my values? And so on. And then the final thing we've got in a non-tabular case is we have got basically policy uh, 
evaluation and policy control where we can't directly um, keep track for every state what its value is. So we have to use some sort of an approximation. So we like to have some sort of a F that approximately maps a state to a value. And this is kind of approximately here. Uh, Jake, give me an example of something that does function approximation. Some method from last semester. Okay. <laughs> Varun. Uh, linear regression. Say again? Linear regression. Okay, linear regression is a possibility, yep. Polynomial approximation. Jake, do you want back in? No. Okay. <laughs> Justin. Justin. Um. What's hot in machine learning and in artificial intelligence these days. Neural network. Neural network. I love it. <laughs> Jake was in the neural nets class. That's what I did. So, good. so uh, neural network is a good example of something that is a function approximator. It takes some input and it provides an output. You give it um, uh, examples, right? So that's basically what we'll do. We'll say, well, we know this state has this value, and this state has this value, and this state has this value, and this state has this value. Tell me about what you think is the best guess for this unknown state, okay? for this brand new state that I never told you about. That's function approximation. So we are not going to learn about neural networks at all, but we may use them as a black box. And all it really is doing is an approximation. Okay. So you could generalize. All right. That's it for the overview today. Now we have an exercise. So this exercise, I need a volunteer. Is anyone, like in drama in high school or college? No drama kids. All right. Is there anyone who is willing, so I'm gonna see if you can fool yourself. Uh, is there anyone who's willing to be a guinea pig? Excellent. I need you to leave the room. Well, actually, I can, I can tell you this right now. We are going to be doing a reinforcement learning uh, situation. We are going to be providing you an environment and giving you some rewards. The reward is, there is one long-term reward that I won't tell you what it is, but the intermediate reward, here we go. Is that, okay? So that is a reward. You, your goal is to maximize your total reward. Can you leave the room while we all talk? <laughs> so this is like dog training, all right? Human training in this case, right? So I will go ahead and be the trainer. We need to decide what it is we want him to do. That is, what do we want to end up him learning how to do? Okay. He could, you know, stand on one foot, crawl, uh, crawl. Handstand. handstand, no, we don't have enough time for that. Um, we need something that he can master fairly well. Uh, you know, hands over here. Uh, a jumping jack. A jumping jack? Anything more than that or just a jumping jack? <laughs> okay. I could try that one. I'm not sure I can get that. So we'll, we'll start with a jumping jack, and the bonus will be that. OK? All right, coming in. Remind me your name. Mazda. Mazda, yep. Head on to the, head on to the front so everyone can see you. What a beautiful environment. <laughs> You shall begin.
Did we tell him what to do? All he had were rewards from his environment. Now, here's what we failed to do to begin with. Right? Normally, you have to pair the clicking like, with treats, uh, some sort of actual reward, so that the click itself becomes rewarding. We didn't do that. We just told him, hey, it's a reward. But uh, it would have been more effective even if somehow we gave him a little jolt of dopamine every time we hear that. Which is what I do with my dogs, right? And you give them a little treats for a while, and then they just love the clicker. So, um, Was this a stationary environment or a non-stationary environment? Um, Garrett? Garrett. I think it was stationary because only his actions mattered. Nothing about the environment changed. Well, let's think about that. Did you feel that the environment changed, Masa? Um, slightly, but not too much. Like, also, it would be because of my own actions. Like, I opened that, but it didn't really do anything effectively. So, for me, it changed my environment because then I wouldn't be able to step on it. Yeah, that's true. I, so the way I was thinking about it, this is something called shaping, right? Here's one possibility, what we could have done. It would be very simple. Once he comes up here and does a jumping jack, We'll give him a reward, and I'll click. And before that, I won't. Could he have gotten a reward? Yeah. Would we have finished by 2.30? <laughs> no. Instead, right, first, I don't know what you thought. What I was trying to do was just give him a reward for facing the audience. Because we didn't say this, but I thought a jumping jack to you guys would be the best. Right? I was so happy when he put his hands up in the air. Like, oh my god, I'm lucky. <laughs> right? This is something I can reward. Right? But it wasn't a jumping jack. But it was like that hands up, and then when he brought his hands down, I was going to do it again. Although we, he quickly went from there to, to a jumping jack. So I actually was changing the environment and the rewards. Like, eventually, it wasn't good enough to just be facing you to get rewards. I wasn't going to be given it. Right? So, so it, um, it was actually a... They normally call this curriculum learning, right? Actually providing a structured set of environments or a change in the environment over time so that you learn the little part and then you learn the next part and then you learn more and more and more. Okay, so um, that's, that's what I was thinking of doing. But this worked better than I expected. 
um, as I was worried he was going to actually take off out the door and then we're going to be really in trouble or spend all his time back there. And it's like, so. Um, so I would say the environment was changing, and that's something we don't really know how to do very well in reinforcement learning right now, but it would be very effective in speeding stuff up right now for reinforcement learning. You need a lot of interaction with the environment because we don't have a good way of having this, this sort of training that happens because you know, I had to be there as a human in the loop um, adjusting things over time. But it's interesting that something got posted about a year ago about reinforcement learning. That if you want to really get good at reinforcement learning, take an obedience training class. Um, because that is what obedience training, you know, dolphins and uh, dogs and things like that. They're just looking for that reward. And uh, you need to learn how to, how, to, how to give that reward. So. Part of what we're going to be learning about is how to design system, how to design problems as reinforcement learning problems. And part of that is what's the environment, what are the states, what are the rewards? Uh, we got five more minutes. Let's just talk about a few possible reinforcement learning problems. How would we, how we would set them up? Can't figure out how to put this top back on. I guess I'll figure it out after class. Um, oh, I got it. So let's say we're trying to solve a maze. All right, if there are harder mazes and simpler mazes, uh, if you're trying to train, I don't know, rats or planaria, worms, or things like that, the simplest maze you can have is something like this. Let's see, where to go? It's a pretty bad looking T, right? So they start here. This is the uh, agent. And then you have some sort of a reward here, here. And eventually, what are they going to learn? Dave? To get out of the maze. To get out of the maze, and which way are they going to go? Wherever the reward is higher. Yeah, presumably wherever the reward is higher. So let's say we set up this problem. Let's make it, let's make it slightly uh, longer maze. So let's say the maze actually is like. I don't know what a maze look like. We have some dead ends. And basically, there's little grid, grid marks in here, right, as to where you can go. So at any point in time, you can go left, right, up, or down. And uh, let's say here is our word. So the goal is to get out. So here's my suggestion. So we know what the states are. The states are this guy is at a particular location in the maze. How about this as a reward? The reward is going to be one at this R location, right? When they get out, so say at the exit, and zero otherwise. Will the agent learn to get out of the maze? Matt. Matt. What do you think? Say that again? At least not for a long time. Why? Um this got to be guided towards the exit until it's actually at the exit. True, but there are I don't know. 20 different states, and we'll throw, you know, I don't know, an hour CPU at it if necessary. So over time, will it learn? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a lot of stuff. Will it learn the most direct path? Um, not necessarily. 
necessarily. Cause? If it finds something that works and then just keep on doing that. Okay, is there any advantage? So let me give you two different possibilities. It might learn to go zip, or it might learn to go zip, 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 zip. According to what we said we're trying to maximize, are those any different? What's the reward in the first case? Directly leaving. And what's the reward in the second case? So do we like, do we really want it to be sitting in here just spinning around or do we want it to leave as quickly as possible? Okay. Julian, how can we change the reward structure to convince it to leave? Um, or that is not only to exit the maze, but to exit the maze directly. So the reward, okay, but it's a scalar. So at any point in time, as this guy moves to a new state, we get to give a reward. We get to reward as it moves from one state to another state. Right now, the only reward we're giving is moving from this state to this state, and we're giving a plus one. So how do we want to change it? I mean, you have, you can provide a reward from any transition, from any state to any other state. Any thoughts? Um, maybe we could like have like less a value that's less than one as we get closer to it. So let's say, so if we give it partial rewards, so let's say if we went up, we want to give it some reward. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And if we go left, we don't want it to give it any reward. So if we give it no reward, going this way, would, it, would we get a positive reward going this way? So if we give it zero going left, would we get positive going right because it's getting closer? Yeah. Okay, so here's how a smart rat is going to maximize their reward. They're going to go up. So if they just leave, they get a reward. If they go left and then right, they get more reward and go up. In fact, their best bet is to go left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, and they can get an infinite amount of reward. So it was a good guess. It's a good try. Uh, anyone have a thought? Go ahead. We could give it a negative reward for living. So every time in the maze and not quite out, we subtract <laughs> something from it. So we'll give it zero. It's like, thank good, your, your awful life is over. <laughs> and it's like, I want to maximize my reward. The best thing is to get out of here as quickly as possible. Good. So for Monday, uh, do your reading both for today and for next Monday. And sorry, yes, Monday. And there is a homework. It's a couple of exercises from the book. OK, I'll be in the cafe for 20 minutes. Have a good weekend. <laughs>